Hello, I'm Ben McKeckin, host of the Lord's Prayer podcast. With theologian David Honey, we are going to take a closer look at the world's most famous prayer to enrich our own conversations with God through the prayer Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. In every episode, we will explore a different line, clause, petition, request of the Lord's Prayer, always with the aims of glorifying God and firing up our own prayer lives. David Honey is a lecturer in Christian thought at Moore Theological College in Sydney, Australia. David also wrote The Last Things, a detailed book about how the Lord's Prayer is a lens for understanding God's purposes for us in Jesus, now and into eternity. This is episode six. Forgive us our sins, our debts, as we forgive those who sin against us, as we also have forgiven our debtors. We invite you to tread slowly and carefully here, as forgiveness might be a live and painful, maybe infuriating consideration for you right now. And for some time, it's been that way. David and I hope that wherever your forgiveness journey is at, this conversation will help. But before we seek out forgiveness, David starts us off, as usual, by orienting us to where exactly we are up to in our podcast voyage through the Lord's Prayer. We're up to our fifth out of uh, six different things that the Lord Jesus asks us to pray. Five different ways in which the fatherhood of God will be on the earth, what it is in heaven. The first three uh, were focused on what God deserves. He deserves to have his name made holy throughout the world. He deserves for his kingdom to come throughout the world and he deserves for his will to be done. We know through the New Testament that those three things are brought about through Jesus. And then Jesus turns our attention then in response to God's promises, how then should we live? What is our life like? The first thing that Jesus put before our attention was the need for God to preserve us. Uh, More literally, the words are, give us this day our daily bread. But as we talked about that, we saw that really there's a not only will God preserve for us in our circumstances, there's the spiritual reality of what we need from God through Jesus, and that is preservation of life beyond sin, death and evil. So ultimately resurrection. And we need to live a resurrection life leaning towards the future that uh, Jesus is bringing to us. If you don't have all of that in mind as you pray the Lord's Prayer, then as we get to this fifth petition, like we discussed last time, there's a big shift in gears Mm. from the first three into four and giving us our daily bread. Another big change in gears, it seems like, when now forgiveness gets dropped in to this prayer, sort of like came out of nowhere. Forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Well, what Jesus has in mind is the central idea that the Bible talks about, and that is forgiveness of sin. We are all sinners. We all reject God. We all try and live our own way without him, ignoring his word to us, his promises to us. That's what it is to be a sinner. And we need to be forgiven for that. God didn't make us to live in envy of his sovereign power over us. He made us to live as his children who love him and seek to glorify him in the world. When David said we need to be forgiven for that, I initially thought when we were talking that he was suggesting for some reason God must 
offer us forgiveness. So I was immediately considering diving in with a, really? Does God really need to? Does he have to? Is it a must for God? Glad I didn't because David continued very soon after to explain that the need to be forgiven is all on our side, not God's. That is, we need God to offer forgiveness to us. God is just and uh, he gives to each one what they deserve because he is righteous. He relates rightly and simply waving away our sin isn't the right way to treat sin but also we can bring it to uh, say a more personal level. If I wrong you deeply and God says, oh, don't worry about it, Ben. How is that just for you? It's not. It's not at all. <laughs> I'm struggling to find better words than it's not. It's not at all. And so a core aspect of our ability to live together well is that we relate rightly to one another and we only know how to relate rightly to one another by looking to the God who is righteous and central to his righteous way of relating to us is taking our sin seriously. And so therefore, the process of forgiveness is actually made up with, and we'll come to talk about this uh, later on, I think, in this discussion. Firstly, admitting that something wrong has happened, and then asking for forgiveness for it. When, if I wrong you and I say, Ben, I'm really sorry I said those terrible things about you, please forgive me. Now, in that dynamic, I have named something wrong. And I've also named myself as being indebted to you because of it. I wronged you. Please forgive me. That is, please release me from this wrong that I have done for you. In all that process, I am showing myself to be indebted to you. So we learn that because Jesus teaches us to ask God for forgiveness. When we ask God for forgiveness, we say, I'm sorry, God, that I didn't treat you as God. I didn't treat you as my heavenly father. I neglected going from the things we were talking about last time, I neglected the good things you've provided for me all the time and the way that you keep my life going. I've ignored that. I've taken it for granted. Please forgive me. The original hearers of this prayer, Jesus' disciples, the crowd that were around him as they were listening to the Sermon on the Mount, and then more broadly, the Jewish people, God's people, what did they know of forgiveness at this point when Jesus is sharing this prayer? Well, they have a fantastic system of law set up by God uh, through Moses and the people of Israel way back in the Prince of Egypt time. <laughs> I just realised so, the prize for the most referenced um, source outside the Bible during the Lord's Prayer podcast with David must go to the 1998 DreamWorks animated movie musical the Prince of Egypt. David's mentioned it like a million times. Well, a handful at least. I, I actually haven't seen the whole thing of the Prince of Egypt, but I'm sure you also know enough about it like I do to realise that it's a sing-along cartoon treatment of Moses going from living in the Pharaoh's household to leading the Jewish people out of Egyptian slavery to the Promised Land. It is a helpful pop culture shorthand for what we read about in the Old Testament books of Exodus and Deuteronomy, although the musical Moses doesn't quite cover off the details David's about to dish up. And the law that God gave to the people, the most famous part of that is the Ten Commandments, was a description of how they are to live together rightly with God and rightly with each other. If you broke the law, what went along with that was a system of sacrifice. That is, there were various kinds of sacrificial offerings that the people had to present to God 
in the temple in order to make right or be made right with God. So God provided this whole system whereby people could be forgiven for their sins by substituting uh, a bull, a goat, a bird, a whatever it was, instead of themselves. The blood was shed instead of their own blood uh, so that they because could Because that be was forgiven. effectively the payment, the consequence of sin against God. Right, yeah, the, the, the wages the severity, of sin are death. The severity of sin, the wages of sin is death. Sorry, David. Cut you off there as I was scrambling to keep up and I robbed you of landing that potent statement from Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And the second part of that summary of the reality that we live in is wonderfully good news. But... Let's now continue to sit with the weight of the first part. For the moment, sit with the weight of that. Sin is so bad in the eyes of God. It almost sounds like a tautology, but sin is so atrocious yeah. that it would need to be dealt with in such a way to, demonst- to even demonstrate to us the magnitude of sin. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So the people of Israel had this whole... Uh, legal and spiritual framework in which they lived such that when it comes to being forgiven by God, they get that. You go up to the temple and you make an offering and in making that offering, your sins are covered and you are considered forgiven by God. Should we have our minds blown more often by forgiveness by God? Because... God is just and sin is terrible and so the right thing to do, wouldn't it be, is just to well allow the consequences to come to bear upon us of our actions and yet forgiveness is extended. Yeah, that's right. We should be, we should be uh, blown away for various reasons. I think we live in a culture in which forgiveness is really hard to find. So we know what it's like to be unforgiven by others. You're talking about people who follow Jesus or people who don't just across our society, forgiveness just seems to be going missing. Yeah, yeah. Think of the way that people are publicly shamed on social media. You say the wrong thing in a tweet or on Facebook and people stack on, you know. Millions of people might get drawn into a Twitter feed uh, haranguing this person for what is actually uh, an honest mistake, uh, possibly even a relatively trivial thing, forgiveness is really hard to find. And when we wrong those who we love, uh, I think we all know how painful it is to live with that wrong and not to be confident that we've been released from it. And so people grow with all kinds of insecurities because they're not used to being forgiven. They're not, and what that means is that they're not confident that they are lovable. That God would forgive us when our sin deserves death is, you know, a gazillion times even greater than that. I should be then trying to latch on to just how enormous forgiveness is when, whenever I pray the Lord's Prayer, let alone just walking down the street and thinking about it. But when I'm praying the Lord's Prayer and I come to this fifth petition, I should be trying to wrap my hand around this incredible gift that God extends. It is a gift that he's extending, isn't it? Because similar to our conversation last week about the previous petition, this is written in such a way where or at least the English translation could suggest that I'm demanding this of God, yeah. or telling God, God, you've got to forgive me my sins, my debts, um, as I forgive others. And we can get to that second part as well. I imagine mm. in your answer you probably will, as in, okay, so if I forgive you, David, for what you've done, well, then, God, you've got to forgive me. Like, is, it, it, um, is that I, what's going I seem on? like I'm misunderstanding this, David. Well, like we spoke about with God's provision, we need to approach it from the position that God, if you don't forgive me, no one will. So please forgive me my sins as I forgive others their sins. Press pause. Sometimes just hearing something said slowly, deliberately, with meaning, can etch it deep 
within your soul, my soul, perhaps as it had not previously. That's how I felt when David just basically said again the part of the Lord's Prayer that we're focusing on in this conversation. It made me want to sit with God's forgiveness of me, of you, for, for a while, here, together. Before David continues with further unwrapping this breathtaking gift, and once he gets done doing that, you're going to want to pause again, reflect, rewind, pray, praise God. It's a gift because, let me read to you from the beginning of 1 John. This is something that uh, people may well be familiar with. John writes to the church, If we say that we do not have sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My children, I write these things to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the propitiation, the atonement for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, I read that out because I want people to realise what the Bible is saying is that when Jesus asks us to ask God to forgive him, sorry, to forgive us, he's already ready to do it. The Lord Jesus is already standing before God, ready to present his own righteousness in place of my sin so that I can be forgiven. The gift of forgiveness is already there. And so when Jesus encourages us to pray, Lord, forgive us our sins, it's because our Heavenly Father is actually more ready to forgive our sins than we are to ask for it. That reminds me of something that we've discussed several times on the Lord's Prayer podcast. And if anyone's just joining us for the first time, it's great that they're here with us, but they really should go back to those earlier conversations because there's loads of gold to be mined back there, including how several times, David, you've indicated how if you dive a bit deeper into the Lord's Prayer and also where it sits across the Bible, you can better understand how so much of what we're praying in the Lord's Prayer points to ultimate fulfilment realisation in Jesus. Yep. So, David, at this point in the fifth petition, why did Jesus not break into his own prayer and say something to the effect of that forgiveness is found, forgiveness of sins is found in him, what he's come to do, what he achieves on the cross and being resurrected on the third day. Why did he not explicitly say that <laughs> ah, yes, in this prayer? He, he like it's, he it's not in there, is it? Like I know he could have. That's that's what I'm saying. If you can get into the mind of Jesus again, David, what's going on here? Why did he not say? And it's about me. Well, at a basic level, as we said earlier, the Jewish people that Jesus was speaking to already had a whole system of understanding the possibility of being forgiven by God. David's succinct summary about the people of God, the Jewish people before Jesus, having systems, practices, rules, roles for seeking forgiveness from God, that's fleshed out in vastly greater detail in the first five books of what we now call the Old Testament. How they play out is expressed across the whole Old Testament, but the setup and rationale is particularly found in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. But there's always a catch with that. You have to keep going back. You have to keep going back to the temple. You have to keep offering up sacrifices. And the writer to the Hebrews kind of gets onto this when he's writing to uh, a Jewish audience. He says, look, we know that the blood of bulls and goats won't cover sin completely. It's actually a, a special provision that God has made in order to live with sinful people. But... There is an offering which covers sin once and for all. Now, Jesus doesn't mention that in the prayer here, but it does come out uh, in the rest of the gospel story. And I think it's kind of important, particularly, say, when we understand the Lord's Prayer in the beginning of Matthew's gospel. This is part of 
capturing the imagination of his apostles, his followers, his disciples, so that they'll ask him, yeah, but how do we avoid being sinful so that we always need forgiveness? Now, Jesus spends his whole three years with them, teaching them about that, and it comes to fulfilment on the night before he died when they celebrate the Passover together and he says, eat this and drink this for the forgiveness of sins. My blood will be shed for the forgiveness of sins. And in part, I think he needed to work them up to understanding that the Son of God, the Messiah, who was supposed to rule over Israel, was actually going to die. If I can slip a bit sideways in the Gospel story in Mark chapter 8, it's a famous point in the Mark story. Jesus says to the disciples, who do you say that I am? Some say you're the Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets. Yeah, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus says, that's terrific. And we're going to go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the Romans and crucified and on the third day he'll rise from the dead. And what did Peter say? No way. No way, Lord, that's never going to happen. The disciples took a long time to learn that. And so as Jesus is teaching them this prayer, in the first instance, he taps into the fact that they already understand as Jews, yes, there is forgiveness. They will come to understand once he is raised to life again from the dead that his is the sacrifice that makes uh, forgiveness available always and everlastingly. Is it correct for me or anybody else to shorthand that to, so Jesus is the right, the better way to forgiveness and the previous system the, that we often refer to as the Old Testament law, that wasn't. Perfect. Was, That's a perfect summary of everything I've just said. <laughs> yeah, but that, that, can't that indicate though that God did something wrong previously and then he had to kind of come and sort it out later with Jesus? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it could. Uh, it could. Why did, he, why did he waste so much time? That, but also that, as you said, um, the the blood of the what's the quote from the Bible? The, the blood, blood of bulls, bulls and goats, goats will not. I'm now forgetting my lines from the will Bible. Will not cover sin. Will not cover sin. Thank you very much. I'm glad you're here. Yes, yes, I am. Yeah. Look, I'm sorry I garbled that quite critical part of the Bible. If you want to go deeper into the scope of that reference to blood of sacrificial bulls and goats not being able to cover sins. You should go off and meditate on Hebrews 10 for a while, as David just pointed to. And also consider Psalm 40, which is the original spot in the Bible where the writer of the Hebrews was getting their insights from. But now, back to me, still trying to raise a polite challenge to the plans of God. So even with that sort of line, is that not an indicator that, will God got it wrong? Like God didn't Mm. know that? Yeah, no. (laughs) It's to teach the people, and Moses taught the people this, the whole sacrificial system was always a gift of God's grace. The Israelites pretty quickly got confused or had to keep being reminded that they were somehow doing something that would win God's favour through offering sacrifices. After a while, they they began to think, we have the temple, that must mean that God loves us and he's on our side. And the prophets come along and try and remind the people, listen, God chose you to be his people. You were always in his favour. The whole sacrificial system was a gift from God because you're hard to live with, you're sinners, and you keep trying to thwart God's plan for you. So the law was always good, as Paul tells the Romans, and the sacrificial system that God had put in place was there as a gift because forgiveness itself is a gift. And so God came to prove that once and for all in his son, the Lord Jesus, by giving himself as the gift. Just a quick word of warning. What follows is a uh, slightly rambly build-up by me into a bunch of related questions for David. So hang on for the ride because in the end I do get there and David's response is worth the journey. At this fifth petition in the Lord's Prayer, I actually think a lot of people probably have spent a lot of time focusing on this, maybe 
like me, people have learned it when they're a kid and you often recite it and you don't tend to think about that much. But I think at least one line in the Lord's Prayer that a lot of people would have done some hard thinking on is this one because we just spoke then about forgiveness in sin being in Jesus and that only Jesus forgives sin. God forgives sin through Jesus. But this second part of this fifth petition in the Lord's Prayer is talking about us forgiving Mm. others. Mm. How can I forgive somebody else? Like, isn't it redundant if God's forgiving them? Mm -hmm. It's between them and God. What's it got to do with me forgiving? And it can also sound a little bit like, am I forgiving them of their sin? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. All those are good questions to ask. And this is the kind of thing that we really need to chew on uh, with this petition. All the petitions are actually there to chew over even though we do get into the habit uh, of reciting them quite quickly. The short answer is I don't have the right to forgive your sins. Only God can do that. That was my understanding too. Yeah, so I think this second part might confuse people about what exactly is it that I'm doing. Yeah, so I think what uh, the New Testament goes on to make uh, known to us, uh, so Paul says this to a couple of at a couple of different churches. Forgive as you have been forgiven, and the idea that uh, bubbles up once you look at all these different ways in which uh, forgiving each other is discussed is that God has given me the gift of forgiveness of my sin through Jesus. It's not mine specially. My sins are actually forgiven, but this general gift is available to all who call on it. So when I forgive you your sin against me, in one respect what I'm doing is saying, well, I'm recognising that despite what you have done to me, Jesus has died for that sin too. And so I'm releasing you of the debt you owe to me because Jesus has died for your sin too. And I can't really take Jesus' death for my sin seriously if I'm not prepared to see that it actually applies to you as well. I've got this far in our conversation, David, without pointing out something I probably should have mentioned earlier, is that forgiveness is hard. (laughs) And and just as you're um, sharing that then, I'm thinking about all the various people, myself included, but also other people I know, people near and dear to me, that some of the things that I know they have been challenged to forgive, let alone have actually forgiven, are massive. And then I think about all the bazillions of people around the world that have had all kinds of things, all kinds of sins done towards them, at them, affected them by another person. And so to speak about this petition in the Lord's Prayer it may be really real for people in a way that other parts of it aren't, could like really cut to the core. All the other bits, I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm pretty good with praying that. But this, this, like, and I understand um, Jesus died for my sins and, yeah, I'm a sinner and all those kind of things, but this person did that. And so my forgiveness of them, it, like, one, it can be hard to even work yourself up to the position of wanting to do that, let alone finding yourself able to, because it can seem like you're forgetting it mm. or condoning it yeah, yeah. or, you know, brushing it to one side. Yeah, all it those doesn't matter. Words. It doesn't I'm matter. I'm okay, you're okay. It doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about at all. And I, and I think we can easily see that by the f- way in which God takes sin personally. We talk about receiving the gift of forgiveness, but it cost God his life. The Son of God gave himself up in the the most gruesome of ways, not just sort of rejected by his friends or abandoned by his friends, not just harangued by his family or even imprisoned wrongfully by his people. He's publicly executed as the opposite of what he really is. Jesus was sent to the cross because the cross is a punishment given firstly to slaves but secondly and more importantly to political rebels. The crucifixion was for those who rebelled against the state and challenged imperial power. 
And so when Jesus is crucified, that's the Jews saying, your claim to be the son of David and the king of Israel is actually rebellion. Now, that's the total opposite of who Jesus really is. And all of this while he's coming to save sinners. He's nailed to the cross by the people he's going to save and he submits to it so that they can be saved. That's how personally God takes sin and death and evil. And so when he encourages us to consider forgiveness, he doesn't take it lightly. He knows what it's like to offer forgiveness and have it rejected. He knows what it's like to forgive fake repentance. Oh, I'm really sorry, I won't do it again, I promise. Oh, I don't know what was going on with me, i just become a crazy man. God knows exactly what that's like. And in the power of his spirit, he gives us a gift of freedom from sin. In the first instance, of course, I'm freed from the penalty of my sin. But in a second and I think really profound way, I can be free from the burden of anger and resentment and bitterness that will live with me for my whole life if I can't forgive you. We all bear a burden in broken relationships. There's those who break it and those for whom it's broken. The tragedy is that, say, the innocent party, they still have to live with their resentment, with their rage, and that kills us too. And so the gift of forgiveness that comes through the Lord Jesus and in the power of his spirit too, we, don't do, we can't do it all by ourselves by any means. You can't just work yourself up to this. But God releases us from the burden so that I can say, yes, I forgive you. Even if you don't want it, I'll be free of it. I'm free of the burden of our broken relationship. That's the kind of spiritual healing that comes through uh, praying a petition like this. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. As we love to do here at the Lord's Prayer podcast, may I again encourage you to take a moment, rewind if you have to, pause, sit, linger, and soak further into what David has just shared with us. Such liberating truth. So don't be shy about taking it to heart and deploying it to the degree that you're able to in the power of God's Spirit. That potent note of pivotal application causes me to note. That's a very handy transition point to finally talking about what this will mean for our prayer life, because I just heard you say then that if I'm praying this part of the Lord's Prayer, praying all of it, but really focusing on this in particular, if this is an issue that I'm really struggling with, uh, praying it over and over again, giving it to God, trusting the Spirit will work in my life to give me at least a consideration of forgiveness, if not an attitude of forgiveness, which is where we should all be striving to be. That's a very strong aspect aspect of a changed prayer life for me. Can you see any others flowing out of this fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer? I think it gives us a kind of resilience insofar as when I bring the slights of my daily life before the cross of Christ, I'm encouraged to think, oh, okay, well, God has forgiven me all of this. I could probably do a little bit more in giving, cutting people slack. I often feel sometimes, uh, just a word of personal testimony here, I'm reading through the Psalms and the psalmist is talking about uh, how God has saved him from his enemies. And I feel shamed because I think, well, you know, I actually don't have that many enemies, or at least not that I'm aware of. So I could probably, considering how I have acted as an enemy to God, rejecting the grace that he's shown to me, or at least worse, even being indifferent to the grace that he has shown me in the Lord Jesus, I ought to be a lot quicker to forgive the slights and inconveniences and those sorts of things. So I think it, it kind of covers both the really deep things and also helps tri- give me perspective 
uh, on the frustrations and things like that that I live with with others each day. You probably expected David to end on such a point because sometimes the obvious is what we need to be most reminded of, especially if we've actually started to take it for granted. Why don't you take some time now to pray to our Heavenly Father to help you to have an attitude of forgiveness in the small stuff and the big stuff because of the gracious gift of forgiveness that we've received through Jesus Christ. Ask God that that incredible truth will shape you, will shape me, will shape us in our never going to be perfect relationship with everybody else. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope the Lord's Prayer podcast is a resource for you and for those you know. So please be sure to share the love. Subscribe also to the Lord's Prayer podcast so you never miss an episode. We've still got a few more to come and you can do that at the Hope Media app, hope1032.com.au or wherever you seek and find your podcasts. I'm Ben McKechn. Thank you to theologian David Honey for his wisdom and insights. And thanks to Jesus for leaving us with a prayer to shape our very existence. Keep praying. See you next time. Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.